Thank you so much for joining us tonight as we discuss how to address procrastination in our students. I'm Sheila, Signet's president and COO. At Signet, you know, we do a lot of executive function coaching and tutoring. Uh, and so we kind of have our own ways of helping students manage their work and complete their work and hopefully learn how to avoid um, the pitfalls that they um, were initially in that that caused them to reach out to us. Um, but um, we're really excited tonight to have an actual expert in sort of the psychology of procrastination join us. Um, so I'm going to stop talking and pass this along to her after I do a brief introduction. So um, tonight we have Dr. Kat Hertzoff joining us. Um, she is a clinical psychologist at Cambridge Psychology Group and leads their Addressing Procrastination group. Uh, she received her Honors Bachelor of Science in Research Psychology at the University of Toronto before earning her PhD in Clinical Psychology at Northwestern University. Dr. Hertzoff completed her pre-doctoral internship and two postdoctoral fellowships at McLean Hospital and Harvard Medical School school. In addition to her specialty addressing procrastination, she's an expert in college transition, depression, generalized anxiety, OCD, sleep problems, executive functioning, um, cognitive, this is a long list, cognitive behavioral therapy, acceptance, acceptance and commitment therapy, dialectical behavioral therapy skills, and exposure and response prevention. So we've got a um, real bona fide expert with us, and I'm really excited to hear, um, you know, some of the underlying causes of, of procrastination and, and some of the ways that it might be helpful to reframe procrastination in order to get through it, um, both for parents and their children. Uh, so with that, I will turn it over to you. Um, anyone who has questions, please do hold them to the end. We will have time for questions. You're welcome to put them in the chat or when we get to the Q&A period, uh, you can ask them then. Thank you Thanks. so much, Sheila, for that introduction. Mm -hmm. um, one other thing that I thought may be helpful for all of us, um, but especially for me, is if everyone could put in the chat, whether they're here in their role as a parent, trying to learn strategies for helping their kid um, not procrastinate, I almost said procrastinate, um, or if you're here in your role as you hoping to learn how to address your procrastination or both. I think that may be something that would be helpful in terms of tailoring the presentation as I go forward. So just, you can start putting that in the chat as I pull up my slides. So um, I'm gonna provide a little bit of background about what prog procrastination is and how common it is, how bad it is and how we can change it or how you can change it. Um, and then I'll spend the significant portion of the presentation on practical strategies, um, which are all about catching it, um, checking it when it's happening, when the procrastination or urges to procrastinate are happening, and then changing it. And um, a lot of it will be kind of focused on that. Um, I'll have some poll questions throughout the presentation. So if you're able to, I would love to hear your responses to the poll. Um, and then I also have a little exercise that we'll do um, in a little bit. And I'll invite anyone who's able and willing to, to join that exercise as we try and um, try and learn basically on how this works. Okay, so my takeaway message when I'm presenting you with this background, I'm gonna just give you right away is you're not alone and there's hope. Like procrastination is a pretty common common problem that people have and their ways to change it. So I'm just gonna leave you with that or lead with that as I go through um, what it is and, and how common it is and so on. So procrastination, or one kind of definition of procrastination is um, a behavior where you're voluntarily delaying an intended course of action despite expecting to be worse off for the delay. So that is one definition that is pretty well accepted in the research literature. Um, note here, it's not laziness. I think a lot, of a lot of us, when we talk about our own procrastination, we kind of, you know, just summarize it. Oh, I'm just lazy. I just need to be less lazy. And nowhere in the definition is laziness part of it. So there are a few kind of important aspects of procrastination. Um, it is intentional. Like we are making a choice in that moment to delay um, something that we committed to. So there's an aspect of commitment. We had a commitment to doing something and now we're making the choice not to. Um, 
even though it's intentional, it doesn't mean that there's a lot of kind of thoughtfulness maybe that goes into it. It can happen pretty automatically. So a lot of the strategies, um, a lot of the first pieces of the strategies that I'm going to be sharing with you, is just increasing awareness. Like when is this showing up? How is it showing up? How can I catch it um, so that I give myself a, an opportunity to, to make a different choice? And then the other aspect, obviously, um, is the negative consequences. So usually people are worse off when they procrastinate. And that's kind of what makes it procrastination um, as, as um, something that has negative consequences. So how common is it? I mentioned already you're not alone. So you may already guess that it's it's quite common. So there's some statistic that suggests that about 20% of the adults in the general population procrastinate chronically. So not just every once in a while, but chronically. And students, um, that is even higher. Those statistics are even higher. So between half to 95% of students procrastinate to varying degrees. So that's maybe not necessarily chronic procrastination, but certainly procrastination that has an impact, especially on studying. And for my first poll, I was curious to hear, let's see, I'll pull it up. How much time do you think is spent procrastinating in, all right, I think I may have to stop sharing and then launch it again. Um, relaunch poll, there we go. Um, how much time do you think students spend procrastinating? And there's some options for you and you can pick the one that you think is most likely. Was it one tenth of their time, a quarter of their time, a third of their time, or half of their time? I'll give you just another second to respond if you're able to. Interesting. It's like a very kind of a bimodal people, people like two of those answer choices. If we average them, we got, a, we got to the right answer. So it is a third of their time students spend procrastinating. So it's a pretty significant amount of time um, that students pr spend procrastinating. Let's see, stop sharing. Perfect. Um, so I mentioned you're not alone if you have college, if you have kids in college, they're not alone. If you are a student in college, you're not alone either. Um, so that is just something to keep in mind to make this a little bit more, to normalize it a little bit more and, and decrease the shame that I think that oftentimes goes around or comes around with procrastination. Now, how bad is it? Um, procrastination negatively predicts actually a range of different outcomes that we maybe may care about. So it, it tends to um, negatively predict performance both at work and in school. Um, there's kind of a, a, a poor, more poorly um, or a poor performance overall. It also tends to um, predict less well-being or lower well-being. So Generally speaking, in the long term, even though in the short term, as you're procrastinating, you may be feeling better for a little bit, in the long term, people tend to be more miserable. The medical field reports that procrastination on part of patients oftentimes is a major problem for their health behaviors. So this could be um, simple things like checkups, like procrastinating checkups, um, following up on recommendations that a doctor um, gave you. So those are some of the other outcomes it predicts. And then for those of you who like numbers, I thought this was kind of an interesting number in terms of financial health. Um, HR Block, I guess, made a, a little survey and found out that procrastinating on taxes and then rushing to get your tax return or your, tax, um, your taxes in results on average in $400 lost um, because things were rushed and there were errors that were made. So I think that is another kind of helpful reminder of, of the, the outcomes, the, the consequences that procrastination has. So given that it is not, you know, not too, too great, what can you do about it? How can you change it? Now, my first cheesy joke, I guess, is that you can procrastinate on it. You can wait. And the reason that waiting actually may work okay is that procrastination does improve with time. 
So developmentally speaking, younger um, folks tend to procrastinate more than older ones do. So if you just wait, maybe it will get better. I think for those of you who are parents, that's actually maybe an important thing to remember is that you have time on your side. It's not all on you. You can kind of, you know, let time do its magic. And a lot of times, uh, natural consequences, right? If your child procrastinates and their natural consequences to the procrastination, that itself can actually help the behavior. Um, so that is one option. Another option is that you can't act now. Um, and that's obviously, you know, I think, I imagine a lot of people are here because that's what they would like to do. They would like to act now um, and find some strategies that work. And the reason that acting now is helpful as well is that there is um, a bunch of research suggesting that interventions work. Um, and the ones that come from cognitive behavioral therapy approaches, which is a therapy um, form that we at Cambridge Psychology Group are all trained in, are especially um, helpful. So there have been some meta-analyses like looking at you know, wide variety of studies and different interventions, and those seem to be um, the most helpful. So that is where, for the second part of, of the talk, um, where I'm going to spend the majority of the time, is giving you practical strategies from cognitive behavioral th therapy or CBT, it's a short for cognitive behavioral therapy, um, which has been found to be the most effective intervention for procrastination and which we offer a Cambridge um, psychology group. So the strategies will kind of break down into three major um, areas. One is catching it. So as I mentioned, a lot of this will be about increasing your awareness of when it's happening, how it's showing up, um, how you can catch this when it's happening and give yourself a choice to change it. Um, checking it, and I'll, I'll kind of explain what I mean by that in a second, and then changing it. So behaviorally, what are some, some activities um, that you can do instead of procrastinating and, and what can you experiment with? So step number one is just catching it. And I'm saying just, um, that's actually a lot of times uh, the most difficult piece is catching it. So there are four questions here to ask yourself as you're learning to increase your awareness. Um, one is what do you procrastinate on? And I'm gonna try and see, I have another poll, I think. Um, although for some reason I can only see one question and that's the first question. I don't know, Charlene, if you're able, oh no, I can see it. Yep, dropped on menu. Okay, yep. so I'm gonna ask, everyone who's able um, to answer, what are you, what do you personally tend to procrastinate on? You can pick more than one, so it's a multiple choice, just to kind of get a sense of um, what people tend to, to do, to have a harder time kind of engaging in even when they know it would be helpful in the long term. So the options are, okay, work, household, study, health, financial, social, family, self-development, decision-making, or others, if there are other things that come to mind. If we, just another second. Seems like the majority of people procrastinate on studying. And we have self-development and then kind of an even split across most of the other ones with the exception of financial. So studying makes sense, right? With the audience, that's probably something that people are motivated to, to learning strategies for. Thank you for, for um, answering that poll question. So that's step number one is knowing what is it that you tend to procrastinate on. And then the second one is how do you procrastinate? Meaning what do you do instead? And that can be helpful to really focus on because that's a lot, a lot of times it's much easier to catch when you're doing it. It's a behavior that you can notice. So if you're doing any of those things, you can ask yourself, is it, am I doing this to procrastinate? So I'll give you a second to answer that question. How do you procrastinate? Again, you can pick more than one. It's a multiple choice question. Do you tend to watch movies? Do you tend to read the news or a book? Serve the web? Yeah, that's a pretty big one usually. Um, do you sort things? Maybe somewhat related to the task that you're procrastinating on, but it's still not getting it done. Uh, do you tidy things? I um, 
I had a friend of mine in grad school who used to procrastinate. That was a term that she invented. I'm pretty sure maybe it was a meme that she came across, but baking, you know, as a form of procrastinating. If you check emails, that's a big one too. Socializing, sleeping, eating. Okay. So the two big ones that, that pop out here, surfing the web and checking emails, which also makes a lot of sense given that most people are procrastinating on studying and studying oftentimes will involve the computer. So it's much easier access for you um, to surf the web or check your emails while you're wanting to or kind of committed to studying. So that's the second, second thing that's helpful to be aware of. And then the third thing, and I'm going to pull this up again as another poll, is how do you give yourself permission to procrastinate? What is your mind saying? You can, you can think of these as excuses. Like, what is, how is your mind making sense of why is it helpful to not do the thing that you committed to doing? And there are some that I listed here again as excuses. You can pick as many as you'd like, multiple choice. So some examples are, I'm too tired, I'll do it tomorrow. Or I don't have everything I need right now, so I can't really start it right now. Or it's better to do when I'm in the mood. Or it's too nice a day to spend on this. Or I'll do it once this other thing is finished. And that usually is like a lower priority thing. I have plenty of time. I can do it later. I won't get much done, so I'll leave it for now. I've got to organize and you can plug in whatever you're needing to organize. Sometimes it is related to the thing that you're procrastinating on. So I need to organize my desk first before I can study. Um, can organize my kitchen first before I can... I can work here, otherwise I'll get distracted. Or I work better when I'm stressed, so we'll leave it to the last minute. And there's another, another option as well. Okay, so we have kind of the leaders are, I'm too tired, I'll do it tomorrow. So fatigue being one of the barriers here, and then I'll do it once this other thing is finished. I think it's a little funny that no one's thinking it's too nice a day to spend on this. I think going into the winter, and if, if y'all are in the north northeast, maybe that is becoming less and less of an excuse, although I think it's, it's beautiful weather this week. So um, maybe that will come up as an excuse as well. So this can be helpful, um, not only to increase your awareness of when you're going down the route of procrastination, but also it can be a helpful hypothesis that will try and and test um, in the later strategies. Like these kind of permission giving statements, they're basically hypotheses that our mind is throwing out in terms of, you know, I'm too tired right now, I'll do it tomorrow, I'll be better off doing it tomorrow. So they can kind of give, give us um, some ideas about how we may wanna change our procrastination habit. And then the last piece as you're kind of increasing awareness about your own procrastination that I don't have a pull on, but that will be important for you or maybe helpful for you to think through on your own is what are the pros and what are the cons of procrastinating? So what are the benefits of procrastinating? And then what are the, the costs of doing that? Um, and that can actually be a helpful thing to write down and have handy that if you're working on procrastination, and um, having a hard time maybe sticking with the thing that you committed to doing is to bring that up as a reminder. Like these are, you know, some of the benefits, usually they, they tend to be short-term and these are some of the costs of me procrastinating can be, help, can be a helpful reminder um, and visually have that ready. Okay, so that's step number one is to become aware. Um, I do think that, you know, the, the take home message of the background of you're not alone is really important here as well to, to normalize that, um, to accept that that is a common human behavior um, so that you can kind of be in the best place to, to start changing that. I'm gonna share the, the model that I'm working on or from for a lot of behaviors when I, when I work with clients and they're wanting to change um, how they're how they're behaving or, or certain patterns that they've noticed that aren't helpful for them in the long term and plug in procrastination here. So this is the cognitive behavior therapy model that um, we use for a range of different um, uh, patterns of behavior that we're trying to change. And procrastination is no different. So procrastination is a behavior of avoidance, of not doing something. Um, and generally the cycle of procrastination goes this way. And I'll use me kind of 
preparing this presentation as an example as I walk you through this model. So generally what happens when we are stuck in a cycle of procrastination is we're approaching a task or a goal. So that's the situation here. So in my case, that was preparing for the presentation. And approaching that task or that goal activates some unhelpful thoughts. Those could be rules or those could be assumptions. Um, for me, at the beginning of preparing this presentation, I, I may have a thought, and this happens to me a lot of times when I'm doing something new, it's like, I don't know where to start. I don't know how to do this. I don't know where to start. And that tends to, so that kind of thought tends to, I think for a lot of us, and maybe I'm particularly sensitive to it, uh, tends to prompt feelings of anxiety. I guess I don't like not knowing what to do or, or, uh, or not knowing things. So I get anxious and I'm sensitive to that feeling of anxiety. I don't like it. It's unpleasant. I don't think any human likes anxiety. Um, and so what I do to kind of avoid feeling that discomfort is I start procrastinating and that's the behavior. So that's how the feeling kind of affects the behavior. So maybe in my case, I do something that I do know how to do. Maybe I'll write, um, you know, notes or things like that in my clinical work. Um, that's something that gives me, so the consequence is, and this is where this kind of gets interesting. The reason we're, we're procrastinating is because it works. So I'm writing my notes and that behavior will affect how I'm feeling. I'm feeling less anxious. Maybe I'm even feeling, you know, proud or kind of, you know, I feel like I'm, I'm mastering something. I'm getting something done because I'm writing, you know, getting, getting work done. Um, so I'm feeling maybe more positive feelings, right? So that is kind of the positive consequence in the short term. I'm feeling better. And that is the reason that that cycle is maintained because it works in the short term. Now, in the long term, one of the problems is that my behavior, so my writing my notes and not working on my presentation, actually never allows me to kind of challenge this thought of like, I don't know where to start or I don't know how to do this. I'm never actually giving myself the opportunity to do that. The other thing too is that there was a deadline, right? I knew when this webinar was happening. I knew at some point I would need to figure out how to do this thing or how to get started. Um, and so over time, the, you know, the pressure to figure it out gets bigger and bigger. And then that feeling may actually grow larger and larger as well. So the anxiety may, may, may grow larger and larger as well. So as the snowball effect um, and maybe increases my urge to procrastinate even, even more because the feeling of anxiety gets even bigger. So that's kind of the model that we're trying to work from. Um, and the idea is that there are two kind of ways that we can we can change the cycle. One is by targeting our thoughts and the other one is by targeting our behaviors. And I'll give you strategies for both of those. How can you kind of target your thoughts, change some of those, challenge them, and or how can you change your behaviors to, to break the cycle? Okay, so that is step number one is just increasing awareness of your own cycle. What does this look like for you? And step number two is going to focus on those thoughts, on those permission giving statements or excuses that your mind kind of throws out as you're trying to move toward the thing that you're procrastinating on. And there are a couple of different ways that you can check those thoughts or check those excuses. Um, and I'll give you examples of both of those. So for the first one, for looking at evidence, you can basically think of yourself as an investigator. So give me one second. Where you're looking at past evidence, so this could be, this would be, need to be factual evidence or reasons that it is better for you to put off this task or this goal. And then you're also looking at evidence that it's better for you to start this task or on this goal right now. And you're kind of trying to be a detective and looking at evidence, or another way to think about it is you're trying to interrogate kind of your own hypotheses or your own excuses, like how, how well do they actually stand up? So a pretty common excuse that my mind shows up or my mind kind of throws out, well, I'm too tired right now. I don't think I'll actually get all that much done. I'll probably just, you know, it's better to just wait until tomorrow when I'm feeling more rested. And then you can look at past evidence. Like, how did that actually work for me? Was it actually better for me? Did I feel more rested or did I get more done? Or would it actually have been better to get started on it today, even though I would have been potentially slower, but I would have gotten something done and then been in a better place the next day. And maybe then, you know, would have had an easier time kind of continuing with the task. So 
first process is all about looking at evidence, factual evidence of the past. How has this worked for me? Um, why, what are reasons to start right now versus reasons to postpone? The second step or the second kind of, you can use both of them actually, but the second um, kind of approach to checking our, our excuses is to do an experiment, a behavioral experiment. And this is a really nice way, I think, to also involve your kids, if this is who you're um, here for, is to ask them to participate in the experiment and be kind of open to maybe their ideas as well um, in terms of what they would like to experiment with. So this is the time in the presentation now where I'm gonna ask you if you're able and willing to, and I think I may be the only one who has a camera on, um, which is completely fine. So I may make a little bit of a fool of myself, but, um, I would encourage you or invite you to, to join me in doing an experiment right now together and kind of seeing how this works. Oh, thank you, Sheila. <laughs> okay, so no I'm gonna start problem. a poll. I'm gonna start a poll. So we're gonna do a pre and post experiment poll and see how this works. And then I'll give you a sense of, of what these experiments can be about. Okay, so the pre experiment poll is what is your level of motivation for physical exercise right now, right? So Kat, I am asking you right now, how motivated are you to do physical exercise right now? And I sadly cannot actually participate in the poll, but I can give it away. I am not at all motivated for physical exercise right now. I'll give you a couple more seconds to, to answer that poll. All right, so maybe the results may be in. So we are more on the lower end of motivation. Uh, slightly motivated maybe is the average of, of how motivated we are as a group to do physical exercise right now. So what I would like you to do, if you're um, willing to and able to, is I would like you, I would like all of us to do a set of jumping jacks. So get up from our seats and do a little experiment and see how that how that changes. So get up from our seats. I'll do the same. You can hear me breathing pretty loudly, I imagine, once I start. And we'll do just, I think, five is what I thought. And we can see, we can see if, if that changes at all um, in terms of our motivation. So on, on the count of three, we'll do five jumping jacks. Uh, one, <laughs> two, three. All right. Okay, so that's all. That's all I asked you to do. And now I'm going to do the post experiment poll, which is going to ask you what is your level of motivation for one more set of jumping jacks? And here again, your options are not at all, slightly, moderately, very. Okay, and I think we had five poll participants at the beginning. Oh, now we have six. Okay, great. And this is nice, seven. All right, I'll give you a couple more seconds to maybe answer and participate. So you can see how this shifted, right? Like the poll results shifted to higher motivation. Like the average now is moderately motivated. I should have, I'm a little out of breath. <laughs> I should have mentioned ahead of time, behavioral experiments, like any good researcher you wanna do you wanna have a big sample of experiments, right? So it's not gonna just be a case study. Luckily our case study worked out uh, or this you know, case study kind of worked to illustrate the point that most of the time, and I'll go to my next slide, action precedes motivation, right? So an excuse like I'm not motivated to work on this thing right now, that there may be some truth to this, right? Like I am not motivated to work on this thing right now, but if I wait until I get motivated, I may wait until forever. <laughs> I may wait a long time. So one way to kind of increase our motivation to work on something is to start, is to take an action. And this is what the behavioral experiments can give you evidence for. That if I am motivated, you know, if I have low motivation, then I do something. Am I feeling more motivated to continue? Right? So that's kind of one example of a behavioral experiment. You can use that, that approach for a lot of the other excuses as well. Um, for example, you could do an, a behavioral experiment 
where, you know, one of the, I think, um, excuses that came up a bunch too is I don't have everything I need to get started. So I'm going to wait. I'm not going to get started right now. So you could have like two conditions, two experiment conditions of, okay, I'm going to wait until I have everything. And then I start versus I start the task, you know, with things that I have, and then I kind of continue going and, and try and get the things that I need. And then you can see which which approach was, you know, was more helpful. And one may be more helpful for, for one task versus the other. But it kind of gives you, it takes away the assumptions that maybe we have. And I think this is where getting kids engaged can be really helpful as well and asking them, okay, what do you, what would you like to experiment with? So if you think this approach is going to work, well, let's test it. Let's collect some data and see how that's working. So those are behavioral experiments. So to kind of wrap up, strategy two of, of checking our, our excuses, most of the time, the conclusion is yes and. Yes, I may be tired right now, and maybe I'm not going to get much done. So there is you know, a kernel of truth to our excuses most of the time, and probably it's not all that helpful for my actions to be guided by that, right? My actions to be guided just by the fatigue or by my level of motivation, um, that maybe it would be helpful to get started on the task that I'm trying to get started on. As we're doing that, I think it's really important to remember or to kind of think about how would you, you know, if a friend came to you with the excuse that their mind is providing them with, how would you respond to them, right? So in a compassionate, gentle, kind way, yes, yes, I hear you, friend, you're, you're tired and it would be nice to take a nap right now instead of working on this thing. And what is maybe one small thing that you can do to get started on this, this thing that you're dreading? Okay. So that's step number two. Step number three um, is going to be all about changing kind of the behaviors, the so strategies for changing behaviors. And the reason that I want to spend some time on that is that a lot of times it's easier, and this was something a client of mine recently reminded me of, it's easier to act ourselves into a new way of thinking than it is to think ourselves into a new way of acting. So the strategies that I'm going to share with you now are all going to be about acting um, and behaving differently. And they fall into three different um, kind of steps or areas that you want to think about is what, what are you trying to do? What are you trying to change or do differently? How are you doing this? Um, and when will you be doing this? Um, these practical strategies are not gonna work for every person or every situation. So some of them may work for some things, um, some of them may not, but at least they'll give you a toolbox that you can choose from and that you can also offer to your kid, right? I think that's the other thing too, is like giving them some choices in terms of what they wanna um, change or strategies that they want to try and then seeing and maybe even, you know, using it as a behavioral experiment, what strategy is working well for them. Okay. So the what, how, and when. We'll start with what. So step number one is writing a to-do list and then prioritizing that to-do list. So ordering the tasks from what needs to be done first to what can wait until last. And as you're doing that, so once you have that list, then it will be really important to break down the tasks that are on that list. And there are a couple of different reasons for this. So one of the reasons is that if it's a big task and you break it down, you feel less overwhelmed. So if you think back to that CBT model, the feeling, the uncomfortable feeling is probably gonna be lower. And so it's much, there's gonna be a lower urge to procrastinate if you've broken it down, it's less overwhelming. Another reason is that if it's actually a little task that's on your to-do list and you break it down and you're like, oh, I guess I can't even break this down. Or once I break it down, it's like tiny, it can actually get you more motivated to get it over with. So those are a couple of different reasons why it can be really helpful to break it down. And then the third piece in terms of what to do is, or what the, the task is that you're procrastinating on, is to estimate the time that you think it will take you to, to, to do this task. This is something that a lot of people who procrastinate are, um, including me, are not very, very skilled at, like it takes a lot of practice. And so practicing estimating time can be helpful because Sometimes it tends to be that we underestimate how long something will take us and then we get really stressed once the deadline gets close. Um, 
But on the other hand, it can also happen that we overestimate how long something will take us. And it can be really helpful to start estimating and then realizing, oh, this actually took me way, way less than my mind made it out to be. And so if we have enough data to kind of support that things tend to be bigger in our minds than they actually are in reality, that is a really helpful piece of data to have to, um, you know, when we when we have that that excuse showing up in our mind about, oh, this is going to take forever. Um, we can say like, actually, no, most of the time when I start things, they, they, you know, go much quicker than I thought they would. So that's step number one. It's just getting clear on what you're doing, what you're trying to do. So prioritizing, breaking down, and estimating how long it will take you to do it. Now, the second step is how you're going to try and target this or, yeah, target the, the task or the goal that you have. So this is especially where it's going to be, there's not a right approach for, for everyone. So it's going to be a lot of trial and error um, to figure out what works for you. So I'll give you an explanation of all of the different icons that you can see on the slide. So one thing you may want to experiment with um, and collect data on potentially is what task you're doing first. Do you want to do the task first that you're dreading the most? Or do you want to do the task first that is the most energizing and actually kind of maybe fun, even though you're procrastinating on it, compared to the other ones is more fun. If you do the rose spreading one first and get it out of the way, that may help you get motivated to continue. On the other hand, if you do the most energizing or most fun one um, first, it may that may actually give you energy to continue. So not a right or wrong, it's just figuring out what works for you. And sometimes if the most dreading one is a really quick one, that can be a really helpful kind of approach to take um, because then it's done, you're not dreading it anymore and it was pretty quick and you can continue with the other tasks on the list. The second thing that you can experiment with and kind of do some trial and error is uh, timing. So are you doing, for example, there are a couple of different conditions that you could have here is, um, you know, saying to, self, to yourself, I'm going to just work five minutes on this thing that I'm procrastinating on. And then you actually, um, you know, when you, when the five minutes is over and you continue to feel motivated, or maybe now you're feeling more motivated, you can extend that short time and you do another five minutes and you continue that process until you no longer feel like doing it. So that's one approach. So starting with a small chunk of time and extending it if you still feel like working on it. Another approach would be saying, you know, I'm going to spend 25, 15 minutes, whatever kind of the, the time frame um, you're setting out to do. And then you're actually stopping after that time, even if you still feel like continuing. And this may be a helpful kind of approach because you're, or could also be a helpful approach because you're still feeling good. Like you're not fatigued. You're not kind of at this point where, you know, you, you kind of hit a roadblock or anything like that. And you're also maybe feeling proud that you've started on the task. So it will make it much more likely that you'll start taking this approach in the future. It's reinforcing you not procrastinating and stopping after the planned time and feeling good. So those are two, two different ways of approaching timing. One thing that I know Steve and I had talked about um, before that both of us love to use, I was basically how I got through my dissertation is um, a method called uh, the Pomodoro timer or Pomodoro method. Um, and you can experiment with the timings that you wanna use there. But I think the traditional one or the original one was 25 minutes on task, five minute break, doing that four times, and then you have a longer break. Um, but again, depending on developmental, you know, time, like how old uh, the person is that you're trying to help, if it's yourself, um, you can kind of experiment with, with the time uh, intervals that, that you want to use there. So that's about timing. The third icon is all about figuring out what time and what place works for you, um, for which task, right? Again, so this may differ by task. Uh, I tend to do really well in workspaces where other people are around also working coffee shop, for example, that doesn't work for some of for some of my tasks. For some of my tasks, I need a quiet place. Same with time. Maybe some tasks are better done in the morning versus the evening. Um, and that's a lot of, you know, trial and error as well and experimenting what works for you, what works for your kid. Distractions can be a big one, right? So making sure the place is free of distractions. Ohio is a method that a client of mine also reminded me of um, a while ago. So it stands for only handle it once. 
meaning if it comes into your mind, if you remember it, if it's a quick, you know, quick, easy task or somewhat easy task, just get it done. Only handle it once instead of it kind of cluttering your mind and being just another thing on your to-do list. If forgetting is a, is a barrier to you working on your task and moving forward, then um, make yourself reminders. These could be reminders in your phone. These could be visual cues um, in your environment to help you remember to do things in certain places. Um, so that can be really helpful as well. And then last but not least, and I think this is, this is huge for parents especially, is the reward. Don't, don't forget to acknowledge and, you know, reward. And this doesn't have to be a financial reward. This doesn't have to be a big reward at all, but just kind of acknowledging, you know, how difficult it was to get started on the thing that you, that you got started on and, and acknowledging that accomplishment. Um, it can be helpful if you're trying to reward yourself. It's something that takes time. So maybe a preferred activity like watching Netflix or whatever, you know, maybe you're, you're doing instead of, um, the thing that you're procrastinating on, it can be helpful to schedule that in your in your calendar or on your schedule uh, to reduce the guilt of actually engaging in it. So you kind of know, okay, yeah, I have it fit in into my schedule and know I'll still get everything else done as well, even if I reward myself right now. So those are some strategies for how you can you can change your behaviors or you can change the the way you're approaching the tasks that you're procrastinating on. So we have the what, what are you needing to do? How are you going to do it? And then last but not least, it's when, when are you going to do it? And I'm giving you a couple of different um, choices here as well. Um, and this is something from a resource that I linked here in the website. And maybe I wonder if I can copy it and post it in the chat. That may actually be helpful as well. So this is a nice self-help um, Let's see, self-help resource. There we go, for procrastination. So something that I've, I've uh, used as well. So there are a couple of different kind of approaches to scheduling when you're doing something. One is the schedule approach and one is the unschedule approach. So the schedule approach here, I gave an example, is you're scheduling specific tasks at specific times. So finish you know, section number one of my presentation, outline at, at two o'clock on Monday, outlining um, section two at 4 p.m. 4 p.m. on Monday, and so on. So specific tasks at specific times. Sometimes this approach doesn't work very well if we feel, first of all, you know, if we feel kind of rebellious, like I don't want to do this thing at the specific time, we, we like maybe spontaneity, it's something we value, so that approach doesn't work as well. Or if we get really, really down on ourselves, if we don't do the thing that we said we would do at a specific time. So then what might work better is the unscheduled approach, where you schedule in all the things that you know need to happen at a specific time. I have a lot of snacks for a long, a long hour each afternoon in this example schedule. But so I'm scheduling all the things that I know will need to happen. And then I'm blocking out the times that I have time to work on the things that I'm procrastinating on. And on those times, during those times, I can go back to my list of priorities and see which ones I want to do. So I'm giving myself a little bit more choice, right? A little bit more flexibility um, in terms of when I'm doing what. Um, and then it can be helpful to kind of collect data on, okay, what did I do actually? What did I spend my time on and how did that go? So it gives you a little bit more flexibility and choice um, if you're rebellious or if your kid is rebellious in terms of, I don't want to, you know, kind of be tied down to doing one specific thing at one specific time, the unscheduled approach may work better. So that's the, those are the steps, the what, how, and when of, of different strategies. Um, something that I like to use kind of a model that a lot of people are already familiar with from school or from work um, that can kind of wrap all of these different things into one or is the SMART goals model. So SMART here is an acronym that stands for what is it specifically that I'm doing? Um, specific is the who, what, where, when. Is this measurable? Do I actually know when it's done? Um, so working more versus saying, you know, or working out more versus saying, okay, I'm going to go on a 30 minute walk every day, 30 minute walk, that's measurable. I can actually check that off when it's done. Is it something that's attainable to me right now? If not, how can I break it down smaller? Is it relevant to my overarching goal? 
this is like a lot of times when our, our excuses are, you know, I need to organize something first or I need to sort something first. Sometimes that was relevant early on in the task that we're procrastinating on, but not so much anymore. So really being honest with ourselves, is that still relevant? And then the time piece that I already talked about. So if you had something in mind as I was going through the presentation that you're procrastinating on, you can take some, you know, take a list uh, or a piece of paper right now and write down a goal that you could, a smart goal that you could have to get you closer to getting that task done. And maybe if you find like 15 minutes to get started on it, even tonight, and put a, a reminder in your phone if that, if that would be helpful, be one way of kind of putting this into action right now, the strategies that you learned. So what I'll end with is to please, please, please be patient with yourself, with your kids, whoever you're working with. Um, this is a cycle. I really like this metaphor of like, if you think about a spinning wheel going in one direction, right? The cycle of procrastination is going in one direction. It has a lot of momentum. As you're trying to reverse that direction, it will take a lot of effort to kind of go against that spinning wheel, right? It will take some effort to kind of pause it and then get the momentum started to move it in the other direction. Um, this is a skill or these are skills, I guess there's a, a whole range of skills, um, which means that it's something we can get better at. It also does mean it takes practice and time um, to, to get better at it. So I think both of those things are true. So be patient with yourself as you're making changes. If you think you would benefit from, from help with that as you're working on this, um, we are, as I mentioned, as I think Sheila mentioned at the beginning, um, we are a group that at Cambridge Psychology Group, um, we have therapists that focus on CBT on cognitive behavioral therapy, um, targeting avoidance or procrastination specifically. Um, I run a group on procrastination, on addressing procrastination that I just put up the, the little um, description and that's me five years ago. So it's been a while, but um, that is a group that is um, happening Wednesdays from 5.30 to 6.30 on Zoom. And it's for adults only. Um, and it's, it's currently open and has a rolling admission. So you can join if you're interested in getting some tips and, and also having kind of the, you know, having the power of the group of knowing you're not alone and having some other people that you can bounce back, um, bounce up ideas up. So that is all I have. And I guess so I can just stop sharing. A couple of questions. So mm -hmm. I'll leave that up to you guys. How do I stop sharing? There we go. Sure, I'll just read a couple out. Um, two people actually say, um, you know, their questions are actually different, but I think the question is uh, similar in terms of its target. They're really trying to stick to a schedule, but it's really hard to get them to do it. One of them's even bought a planner, but she has not filled it out at all. Um, so what do you suggest? I mean, are, are they procrastinating the solutions to their procrastination? Is there a way around that? Planning, like scheduling things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's every time it's just meeting yourself or meeting your kid where they're at. Right. I think that's that has to be kind of the reminder is that you can it's, a, it's again, it's a cheesy. I, I like the phrases, though. I like the memes. I think it was a meme I saw on Facebook. You can only take a step from where you are, not where your mind thinks you should be. So if the barrier right now is scheduling or using a planner, that is the step that, you know, that they need to be taking right now. Not like, oh, I should, I should also already be able to, you know, do the thing that I'm trying to plan. Um, so kind of really meeting yourself or meeting your kid um, where you're at or where they're at in terms of, and asking, right? And being curious. What is it about the planner that feels like that wouldn't be helpful? Or what is coming to mind when I'm asking you to, to schedule something in the planner? Or what is coming to your own mind? as you're thinking about scheduling some things. I do think the schedule versus unscheduled approaches, they may actually be quite helpful because I do think they're oftentimes, especially for kids who are really trying to, you know, um, grow in their autonomy and maybe have that rebellious streak, right? Like saying like committing to, I'm doing this thing at, that, at this time, it takes out so much, so much spontaneity and autonomy. So kind of helping them see like, okay, maybe you don't actually need to schedule specific things. Maybe just schedule the things that are happening and then seeing how much time you have to work on the thing that you're trying to get done. Um, that may be one approach to take and experiment with. 
Great. Thank you. Um, we have another question that I think applies to a lot of people here. Um, I know I hear this from families all the time. Um, we have a parent who, you know, very strong executive functions, doesn't procrastinate, gets things done. And then they have a child or maybe multiple children that just don't. And there's a real gap in just a basic understanding of like, what is actually going on in their brain? How do I relate to them? How do I help them? So one of the questions I wrote down as well is, you know, it's it's one thing to be um, a clinician helping a student or an executive function coach helping a student. It's a totally different thing when you're a family member or a partner or, you know, um, a, a parent. So um, what are your recommendations there when, when there's, you know, a real difference in uh, natural styles, I guess? How, how do you help another person who's procrastinating? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a great question. I think what I would encourage everyone, and this actually doesn't differ as much across like a clinician versus executive functioning coach or parent or anyone else who's trying to help um, a person is being curious and open minded. So taking right, like being really mindful of our own assumptions, or of our own kind of um, tendencies, and trying to set them as much as we can aside and distance ourselves a little, get some distance from them and really being curious about what is going on for, for your kid, I guess, in that moment. Like what, what is your mind? Like what's going through your mind? What are you feeling in your body? Right. To kind of get a sense of like, what are they feeling? Maybe are they anxious? Are they dreading something? Um, being curious about what do you think is the worst that could happen if you did this thing or didn't do this thing? Um, and having some curiosity and openness around that. That's very helpful. Um, I know I have a whole bunch of questions. We don't have a lot of time, so I want to prioritize the people who are here. If anyone else has a question, please feel free to either unmute yourself or ask us, um, or you can type it in the chat. While we're waiting for a question, I will sneak in one of mine, um, which is um, you mentioned at the beginning there are, you know, 20% of adults are chronic procrastinators and then some other percentage of people kind of sporadically procrastinate. What would you say the dividing line is? And, and what I'm after is how do you know when you need expert help to get through this? Or if, you know, some of these strategies just trying to implement them on your own might be enough? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Yeah. I guess one thing would be trying and, and keeping tabs of how, how are you moving forward, even if they're small steps mm -hmm. with the tap, with the, you know, self-help or with the strategies that you're trying to implement in your own, um, seeing if, if there's progress and maybe that is, that is okay, like to continue on my own without expert help. Um, another question oftentimes is how is it working for you? Like what are the negative consequences that you're experiencing right now based on where you're at. And if they're pretty large, like this could be, um, you know, maybe failing a class or having to, or being, you know, having to withdraw from college or, um, you know, maybe even like being fired from the job or being kind of written up at, jo at, at your job, then that may be other indications that something would be helpful to change more quickly. So it doesn't necessarily mean you couldn't make the changes yourself, but maybe mm -hmm. the time it would take for you to make them yourself, maybe too long to um, avoid some of those more negative consequences. So I would really take like a global perspective. Okay, how is this, how is this, how much is this impacting you in your daily life? Right. That's really helpful. Um, and one question that I actually overlooked was uh, kind of a follow on for the, from the parent who can't understand what their child is, is going through. Um, uh, we also get this question a lot when I, when I talk to families about our executive coaching services. Um, uh, the kids are always underestimating or overestimating how long something takes. And that ends up being the reason that they're procrastinating, right? Either it's going to take me forever. So why bother? Or it looms large or, oh, this will take a second. I can wait till the last minute. Um, how do you help a student who, uh, or a person who, who has trouble estimating that time? Uh, write down the data. Okay. Right? So your mind right now tends to, tends to over or underestimate, right? We, we tend to kind of fall into one of those. Um, and a lot of this is going to be practice, right? To kind of calibrate, um, to reality, basically, but it, it, we need we need data to have to, to convince our mind, basically, that yes, I tend to overestimate. So this is something that now you know in my 
35 years on this earth, I know I tend to, I, I tend to make things bigger than they actually are. Um, so for your kid, as they're still learning that about themselves, it can be really helpful to, to just write it down and have them maybe even write it down, right? Like have them write down how long they think something is going to take, right? Estimate. So that was one of the steps in the, what is estimate the time it will take. Mm -hmm. And then, okay, once you've done it, let's, let's take a look and see how, how, how well did you predict that? And was it more or was it less? And I think that works with either way, either underestimating or overestimating. So you can make it kind of a more, you know, collaborative approach. Like, let's see what's actually going on and look at the data. Yeah, I love that. Thank you. Um, so we're about out of time. So I guess we'll we'll wrap up here. Um, but I do want to um, just reemphasize your last slide about being patient. Um, you know, this is one of those situations where it's very hard to fix you know, a broken car when it's speeding down a highway. So this is probably not an approach you want to take when your student is procrastinating and it's an hour before their paper is due. It's not time to start collecting data and thinking broadly about how are they feeling and things like that. Um, in those situations, you just got to support them in trying to get whatever it is done. But when they are in a better mindset, uh, you know, ready to really think about like, how do I solve this problem from the root? That's when these sort of strategies can can come, um, come into play. Um, so uh, again, I want to thank you, Kat, um, for joining us and, and sharing your, your expertise here. This is really, really helpful. Um, families um, who joined us, thank you for your time. Um, and I'm sure, you know, you all have lots more questions. So I'm going to um, put my email in the chat here. Um, I want you to always feel free to reach out to me um, if you have questions. Um, and if it if it feels like uh, Dr. Herzoff's group uh, might be helpful for your family, uh, please do reach out to Cambridge Psychology Group and I can put you in touch with them if you um, need, need help with that. Um, but really, um, we're here to help you navigate whatever the situation may be. Um, and uh, you'll get a recording of this uh, webinar sometime next week once we do a little video editing. Um, and again, thank you all for your time. Thank you so much, Sheila. Yeah. Have a great night, everyone.